In this presentation, we will take a look and give commentary and insights on the book of Jonah. Well-known story among many. Let's take a look at some of the things it teaches us and what we can learn from it. As always, read the chapter before listening to this presentation or watching this presentation on YouTube. You will get more out of it as you'll be familiar with the storyline. By way of introduction, the prophet Jonah was an unusual servant of the Lord. Jonah was called on a mission very similar to that of other prophets. He was to cry repentance to a people ripening in iniquity. Unlike other prophets, however, Jonah responded by attempting to flee from his assignment. Had his reason been cowardice, though it's still wrong, it would have been understandable. The brutality of the Assyrians and the treatment of their enemies was well known. But Jonah's problem does not seem to be cowardice. Rather, it seems to have been resentment against the Lord for giving the, enemy, for giving the hated enemy a chance to repent. Take a look at Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Mati, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Actually, I think that's Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. And then later, when he does go in chapter 4, verses 1 through, when he finally does go there, it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. This is after Nineveh repented. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? In other words, he was afraid that God would give them time and mercy to repent, and that they would. Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Uh, that should be relentest, not repentest, the Hebrew. That is, Jonah knew that God could invoke the climate decreed, but expected he would do so even without the repentance of the people. And so from these two uh, verses, we get the idea that what Jonah was concerned about and had questions about was how how could a people that are so cruel so wicked even have the chance to repent that God would even allow that now we see that as God's great mercy but if you lived at the time and had even tasted a little bit of the atrocities that the Assyrians committed, maybe you would have better empathy towards Jonah. To some who, to someone who had been taught to have Christian love for all men, Jonah's attitude may seem almost unbelievable. But to an Israelite who had been taught that he was the chosen people and that the Gentiles were corrupt and therefore not acceptable to God, Jonah's attitude was more understandable. Though surprisingly, because we accept a different response from the Lord's prophets, Joseph's response was very human. Also, the meaning of the term prophet needs some clarification. From Revelation 19.10, after John is taught by a heavenly messenger, we learn, And I fell at the feet of to, to worship him. That is, John fell at the feet of the heavenly messenger to worship him. And he, the heavenly messenger, said unto me, John, See thou do not, do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thus we see that a prophet, in the strict sense of the word, is one who has the testimony of Jesus given by the Holy Ghost. This is the meaning behind the word prophetess, we see a lot in the Old Testament, meaning a woman who has been given the testimony of Jesus by the Holy Ghost. Today we use the term prophet and apostle interchangeably. An apostle is one who holds priesthood keys to direct the affairs of the church, such as the Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency. You can see that in Doctrine and Covenants 107, 22-33 and Matthew 16, 18-22. 
You can be a prophet, have a testimony of Jesus, and teach him about him, and not be an apostle and hold keys of the priesthood to run the affairs of the church. That's what we see in missionaries all the time, right? Male and female. They are, in a strict sense, prophets, one who have testimonies of Jesus, preaching the gospel. See, it may be in this light that Jonah is a prophet. Therefore, a prophet need not necessarily be an apostle with Melchizedek priesthood keys to direct the affairs of the church. It is in this sense that Jonah was a prophet, one who had the testimony of Jesus and was called by God to preach repentance. It would account better for his actions and why he is concerned that God would let these people repent. These are Gentiles. You've told us always that they are unacceptable, that we don't go to the Gentiles. See, even Peter has to receive a revelation from God before he is sent to Cornelius the Gentile. Because they've been taught for so long that you do not preach the gospel of the Gentiles yet. It's not time. Well, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria and the standardization of terror among them. Let's take a look at what this nation was like and why Jonah would be just a little concerned and just have some questions about, really, they get to repent? The most vital part of the Assyrian government was its army. Warfare was a science to the leaders of Assyria. Infantry, chariots, cavalry, introduced by Asurnasipal, uh, Asurnasipal to aid the infantry and chariots. Snappers, armor made from iron, siege machines, and battering rams were all developed or perfected by the Assyrians. Strategy and tactics were also well understood by the Assyrian officers. But it was not just Assyrian effectiveness in warfare that struck terror to the hearts of the Near Eastern world. They were savage and brutal as well. Now quoting one historian. A captured city was usually plundered, plundered and burnt to the ground, and its site was deliberately denuded by the killing its trees. The loyalty of the troops was secure by dividing a large part of the spoil among them. Their bravery was ensured by the general rule of the Near East that all captives in war might be enslaved or slain. Soldiers rewarded every severed head they brought in from the field, so that the aftermath of a victory generally witnessed the wholesale decapitation of fallen foes. Most often the prisoners who would have consumed much food in a long campaign and would have constituted a danger and a nuisance in the rear, were dispatched after the battle. They knelt with their backs to their captors, who beat their heads in with clubs, or cut them off with cutlasses. Scribes stood by to count the number of prisoners taken and killed by each soldier, and appointed the booty accordingly. The king, if time permitted, presided at the slaughter. The nobles among the defeated were given more special treatment. Their ears, noses, hands, and feet were sliced off or they were thrown from high towers, or they and their children were beheaded or flayed alive or roasted over a slow fire. In all departments of Assyrian life, we meet with a patriarchal sternness natural to a people that leave by conquest, and in every sense on the border of barbarianism. Just as the Roman took thousands of prisoners in lifelong slavery over their victories and dragged others to the Circum Maximus to be torn to pieces by starving animals, so the Assyrians seemed to find satisfaction or a necessary tutelage for their sons in torturing captives, blinding children before the eyes of their parents, flaying men alive, roasting them in kilns, chaining them in cages for the amusement of the populace, and then sending the survivors off to extinction. Ashurinasrapal tells how all the chiefs who had revolted I filleted, with their skins, I covered the pillars. Some in the mist I walked up, others on stakes I impelled, still others I arranged around the pillar on stakes. As for the chieftains and royal officers who had rebelled, I cut off their members. Ashur Banapal boasted that I burned three thousand captives with fire. I left not a single one of them alive to serve as a hostage. Another of his inscriptions reads, 
warriors who have sinned against Ashur and had plotted evil against me from their hostile mouths have I torn their tongues, and I have compassed their destruction. As for the others who remained alive, I offered them as a fiery sacrifice, or fun funerary sacrifice. Their lacerated members have I given unto the dogs, the swine, the wolves. By accomplishing these deeds, I have rejoiced and the, rejoiced the heart of the great gods. Another monarch instructs his artisans to engraven upon the bricks these claims on the admiration of pros posterity. My war chariots crush men and beasts. The monuments which I erect are made of human corpses, from which I have cut the heads and limbs. I cut off the hands of all those whom I capture alive. Reliefs at Nineveh show men being impelled or flayed, or having their tongues torn out. One shows a king gouging out the eyes of prisoners with a lance, while he holds their heads conveniently in place with a cord passing through their lips." That can give you pause, and maybe why Jonah is just a little hesitant. The brutality. One, what's going to happen to me if I go there? Two, really? That kind of people? They get a chance to repent? And so maybe that gives us a little understanding of the context of Jonah and his society and what he is facing and some of the feelings he has. Thus we see why Jonah would be hesitant, to say the least, to want to go to Nineveh and preach repentance. Let's go to Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Jonah was a type of Christ in that he was in the belly of the well, in hell, or in his own words, just as Jesus was in the grave for three days, and then came forth again. However, the story of Jonah and its relation to Christ and Israel is broader than that. Jonah can also be seen as symbolizing the arrogance and exclusiveness of God's chosen people, at the exclusion of others, the Gentiles, especially in the millennium of time or rabbinic or pharisaical Judaism. That Jonah was to save all people who came unto him and that that Jehovah, I apologize, that Jehovah was to save all people who came unto him and that the chosen, Israel, can be banished on account of its sins can be seen in this story. The two great scholars, Kyle and Delich, said, the mission of Jonah was a fact of symbolic and typical importance, which was intended not only to enlighten Israel as to the position of the Gentile world in relation to the kingdom of God, but also to typify the future adoption of such of the heathen as should be observed as should observe the word of god into fellowship of salvation prepared in israel for all nations as the time drew nigh when israel was to be given up into the power of the gentiles the, and trodden down by them on account of its stiff-necked apostasy from the lord its god it was very natural for the self-righteous mind of Israel to regard the Gentiles as simply enemies of the people and the kingdom of God, and not only to deny their capacity for salvation, but also to interpret the prophetic announcement of the judgment coming upon the Gentiles as signifying that they were destined to utter destruction. The object of Jonah's mission to Nineveh was to combat in the most energetic manner and practicality to overthrow a delusion which had a seeming support in the election of Israel to be the vehicle of salvation and which stimulated the inclination to pharisaical reliance upon outward connection with the chosen nation and a literal descent from Abraham." just pausing for a minute. In other words, Israel was cocky and arrogant and prideful, and they wouldn't be destroyed. They were going to save the world. Jehovah would watch over them. No, they had sinned, and he's now going to use the wicked nations to destroy them. So maybe one lesson in the story of Jonah is Jehovah's trying to teach, quit being arrogant, Israel. Back to Kyle and Delich. The attitude of Israel towards the design of God to show mercy to the Gentiles and grant them salvation is depicted in the way in which Jonah acts. 
when he receives the divine command and when he goes to carry it out, Jonah tries to escape from the command to proclaim the word of God in Nineveh by a flight to Tarshish because he is displeased with the display of divine mercy to the great heathen world. And because according to chapter 4 verse 2, he is afraid lest the preaching of repentance should avert from Nineveh the destruction with which it is threatened. In this state of mind on the part of the prophet, there are reflected the feelings and the general state of mind of the Israelitish nation towards the Gentiles. They didn't believe they were worthy of salvation. See the arrogance and pride of Israel. Today, that is manifest in the church. We need to be careful. Back to Kylan Dilich. According to his natural man, Jonah shares in this and is thereby fitted to be the representative of Israel in its pride at its own election. The infliction of this punishment which falls upon him account of his obstinate resistance to the will of God typifies that rejection and banishment from the face of God which Israel will assuredly bring upon itself by its obstinate resistance to the divine call. But Jonah, when cast into the sea, is swallowed up by a great fish, and when he prays to the Lord in the fish's belly, he is vomited upon the land unhurt. This miracle also has also a symbolic meaning for Israel. It shows that if the carnal nation, which is ungodly-minded, should turn to the Lord even in the last extremity, it will be raised up again by a divine miracle from the destruction of newness of life. And lastly, the manner in which God reproves the prophet when he is angry because Nineveh has been spared, chapter 4, is intended to set forth as in a mirror before all Israel the greatness of the divine compassion which embraces all mankind in order that it may reflect upon it and lay it to heart. And so we see a type and symbolism in Jonah and the story of the arrogance of Israel, that Gentiles were not worthy of salvation. Israel has sinned. God is now going to destroy them in their arrogance, and he will let anyone come unto him who will come unto him. And so, a lot of symbolism going on in this. And in jo just like Jonah needed to learn what his arrogance was, the house of Israel had to learn their arrogance when the Assyrians finally come and do finally destroy them. Today, the church will have to learn by its own arrogance, by the things which we suffer and the persecution we get. Remember, in Illinois and in especially Missouri, read sections 103 and 105, a lot of the persecution and things that came upon them were because of their own sins and wickedness, that they were not living the laws of God and how they were treating members of the church and the Gentiles. Jonah, chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. Jonah flees to Tarshish. Oh, didn't put the H on the S at the end of that. Sidney B. Sperry, great Hebrew scholar, says make some important points regarding Jonah's response. A call on a mission and direct from the Lord. But it was no surprise to the prophet to be called, for he had probably carried out many missions for the Lord in Israel before. His surprise lay not in the fact of the call, but in the kind of call and rebellion arose in his heart. It was a call to go to Nineveh, the great city of Assyria, and preach to its heathen inhabitants, for their wickedness had come up before the Lord. Jonah was torn between his loyalty God and the whip of his emotions. The latter were at a fever pitch and in the end determined his actions. Because he couldn't face the mission call, he determined to flee the country and get away from the unpleasant responsibilities. He did not intend to lay down his prophetic office. He merely wanted to absent himself without leave for a time until an unpleasant situation adjusted itself. Now that has some great modern day application. 
How often do we do the same thing? A call comes, and it may be unpleasant. And so we turn it down, and we, or we run from it, or don't even accept it, accept it but don't, maybe not even half-heartedly try to fulfill it because it's unpleasant, and we try to run from unpleasant situations. Just by way of note, we do not know the exact location of Tarshish. So may we be careful. Do we turn down calls? Ones that are formally given or ones informally given to us by the Spirit because of the unpleasantness of the task. Jonah chapter 1 verses 4 through 7. What was the practice of casting lots? In ancient times, lots were cast when an impartial decision was desired. The character and shape of the objects used in biblical times are not known, nor is the precise method by which they were cast, although some scholars suggest that smooth stones or sticks distinguished by color or symbols were used. The heathens cast lots because they believed the gods, that's a little g, would guide what happened. In Jonah's case, the Lord seems to have guided the outcome. John chapter 1 verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish. The account of Jonah being swallowed by a great fish has been the subject of much ridicule and controversy on the part of the world. They use this verse as one argument to sustain the belief that the book of Jonah is simply a parable and not a record of historical fact. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith of the Quorum of the Twelve said, are we to reject it as being an impossibility and say that the Lord could not prepare a fish or a well to swallow Jonah? Surely the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs at the wisdom of the scoffer, and then on a sudden answers, and then on a, on a sudden answers his folly by a repetition of the miracle in dispute, or by the presentation of one still greater. I believe, as did Mr. Williams J. Bryan, the story of Jonah. My chief reasons for so believing is not in the fact that it is recorded in the Bible or that the incident has been duplicated in our day, but in the fact that Jesus Christ our Lord believed it. The Jews sought him for a sign of his divinity. He gave them one, but not what they expected. The scoffers of his day, notwithstanding his mighty works, were incapable because of sin of believing. He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well he's bell, so shall the Son of Man be three nights and three days in the heart of the earth. If it wasn't a true story of fact, that statement really wouldn't have much meaning to it, would it? <laughs> if it was just a made-up story, then maybe Christ being three days is a made-up story. He refers to it as a factual historical incident. Jonah 1, chapter 17. Now the Lord had prepared... Oh, oh, sorry. Continuing this. Another reason to believe the account is only if you believe God could do such a thing. Is God capable of being able to let a large creature, such as a well type, swallow a man and enable him to live for three days? Or do we limit God's power and ability? We, we, even in the church, we get funny with this. God created the earth in six days. And we know a thousand of his, one day is a thousand of our years, so it could have been six thousand years. And still we scoff and make fun that, oh, it's got to be older than that. Really? God doesn't have the power to do miracles quickly as we see in the New Testament with turning water to wine, wine that takes years to make good wine. He does in a matter of seconds. God does not have the ability to create an earth and make it appear as if by the natural eye it took thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. We limit God so much. Boy, we got to be careful. Why do we do that? And if you do do that, why do you even believe in him at all? If Christ Jehovah is limited in what he can do, then I want nothing to do with him. Then he probably is limited in being able to truly save me. See, either Christ has all power or he has none. In between makes little difference. He either has all power or he has none. Christ is capable 
of creating the fish, letting him swallow, letting it swallow a man and surviving three days. Either we believe God has all power or he does not. And if he does not, then why even worship him? Jonah chapter 2, Jonah's prayer. Jonah in his extremity finally turned back to God. His prayer was one of sincere and meaningful repentance. His use of hell, sheol in Hebrew, which means the spirit world and sometimes translated as grave, adds to the parallels with Christ's burial. The language of Jonah's prayer, Jonah 2, 3 through 10, and the language the Lord used with the prophet Joseph Smith while he was imprisoned in Liberty Jail, see DNC 122.7, are similar, both even speaking of the jaws of hell, gaping open the mouth. Also compare Jonah 2 with the language of Alma 36, 17 through 18. Remember when Alma finally comes to himself and decides to turn back. Here's what Alma says. And it came to pass that I was thus, thus racked with torment, while I was hard up by the memory of my many sins. Behold, I remember also to have heard my father prophesy unto the people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, a son of God, to atone for the sins of the world. I, I could imagine Jonah having three days in the belly of a well to be hard up in the memory of his sins. Verse 18, Now as my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried within my heart, O Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of wilderness, and am encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. That's very similar to Jonah, too. Jonah's vow to pay that that I have vowed was his way of saying he would fulfill the mission given to him. And so the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Again, if you think that's just too far-fetched to believe, then you don't believe in Jesus Christ and that he has all power. This is probably nothing for Christ to accomplish. Through bitter experience, Jonah learned that life is much sweeter and better as one runs with God rather than from him. We would do well to learn that lesson. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, why Nineveh, why is Nineveh called the great city? Again, Sidney B. Sperry wrote, Opposing Mazul, the well-known eporium of trade on the up right of the upper Tigris, two artificial mounds lift themselves from the otherwise level plain. The more northerly takes the name of Kajudistik, I hope I got that right, or Little Lamb, after the Turkish village, which couches pleasantly on its northeastern slope. The other is called in the popular dialect Nebi Yunus, Prophet Jonah, after a mosque dedicated to him, which was once a Christian church, but the official name is Nineveh. These mounds are bound to each other on the west by a broad brick wall, which extends beyond both, and is connected north and south by other walls, with a circumference in all of about nine English miles. The interval, including the mounds, was covered with buildings, whose ruins enable us to form some idea of what was for centuries the wonder of the world. Upon terraces and substructures of enormous breadth rose storied palaces, arsenals, barracks, libraries, and temples. A lavish water system spread in all directions from canals with embankments and sluices. Gardens were lifted into midair, filled with rich plants and rare and beautiful animals. Alabaster, silver, gold, and precious stones relieved the masses of bricks and flashed sunlight from every frenzy and battlement. The surrounding walls were so broad that chariots could roll abreast on them. The gates, especially the river gates, were massive. All this was Nineveh proper, whose glory the Hebrews envisioned, or over whose fall more than one of their prophets exult. Beyond the walls were great suburbs, and beyond the suburbs were towns, leagues upon leagues of dwellings, so set on the plain as to form one vast complex of population, known to Scripture as the Great City. To judge from the ruins which covered the ground, the circumference must have been about 60 miles, or three days' journey. 
It is these leagues of common dwellings which roll before us in the story. None of these glories are mentioned of which other prophets speak, but the only proofs offered of the city's greatness are its extent and its population. In this great district, Jonah began to preach. So, an enormous city at that time, size. Jonah chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, what is signified by sackcloth and ashes? Jonah's words appear to have had an immediate and very positive effect upon the Ninevites. Why a non-Hebrew people would believe a Hebrew prophet can only one can only conjecture. We just don't have enough information to know why, but it happened. Perhaps they were shocked into repentance by the appearance of a foreigner who, apparently without thought of personal safety, would come such a distance to unveil the sins of a people he did not know. At any rate, his mission had the intended results. Nineveh repented in sackcloth and ashes. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, A coarse dark, dark cloth made of hair of camel and goats and used anciently for making sacks and bags was called sackcloth. It was also used for making the rough garments worn by mourners, and so it became fixed in the prophetic mind as a symbol for sorrow and mourning. It was the custom for mourners grabbed in sackcloth, either to sprinkle, sprinkle ashes upon themselves or to sit in piles of ashes, thereby showing their joy had their joy had perished or been destroyed. The use of sackcloth and ashes anciently was also a token of humility and, and penitence. When righteous persons used the covering of sackcloth and the sprinkling of ashes to aid them and taint a in attaining the spiritual strength to commune with deity, their usage was always accompanied by fasting and prayer. Daniel, for instance, prefer, preface, prefaced the record of one of his great petitions to the throne of grace with this explanation. I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with, fast, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession. That's in Daniel 9, 3-4. Sackcloth and ashes, accompanied by fasting and prayer and turning to the Lord their atten that attended their use, became a symbol of the most sincere and humble repentance. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. Does God need to repent? The Joseph Smith translation of the Bible renders this verse as follows. This is how it didn't say, and God repented. It should have said, it did say this, and Joseph Smith fixes it. And God saw their works, and they turned from their evil ways and repented. And God turned away the evil that he had said he would bring upon them. A great change that explains what's really going on. Jonah 4, 1 through 11, Jonah was displeased with the Lord. Here Jonah demonstrated a second weakness. He pouted because the people did repent, and God turned his wrath away. Jonah was so upset that he wished he were dead. Though he had repented of his desire to escape the call of the Lord and went to Nineveh, Jonah had not substantially changed his attitude towards the Gentiles. Maybe we have similar things today, people and their attitudes towards some who come to church. Why are they here? God, everyone knows they're this and this and this. And instead of rejoicing in the repentant attitude, Jonah is, Jonah is displeased because of his arrogance that is still there and his prideful nature that, oh, I'm one of the chosen race. Such self-righteousness is unbecoming of anyone in Israel. The Lord taught Jonah in a way that he could understand that all things are in his hand. The gow, the grow, the grow, gourd, I'm sorry, gosh, man. The gourd, the worm, even life itself. First, the Lord sent the dreaded east wind, which was very destructive, for it blew off the hot, dry Arabian desert. Then the Lord caused the sun to beat upon Jonah, making him so uncomfortable that he wished for death. Once Jonah was in that position, the Lord was able to teach him the worth of souls in Nineveh. 
because the thousands who lived in Nineveh were ignorant of the saving gospel principles, they could not fully discern between their right and their left hand. That's Jonah 4.11. Surely the Lord felt more pity for them than Jonah felt for the gourd. This is reminiscent of Alma chapter 26, verses 27 and 37, which say, now, when our hearts were depressed and we were about to turn back, behold, the Lord comforted us and said, Go among thy brethren the Lamanites and bear with patience thine afflictions, and I will give unto you success. Remember, the Lamanites were very wicked and hard-hearted, and some of the Nephites thought they were better than them. And But these sons of Mosiah were willing to humble their hearts in Ammon. And to go amongst these people. Verse 37, Now, my brethren, we see that God is mindful of every people, whatsoever land they may be in. Yea, he numbereth his people, and his bowels of mercy are over all the earth. Now this is my joy and my great thanksgiving. Yea, I will give thanks unto my God forever. Amen. See, Jonah did not have that attitude yet, and God was working on him. By, by means of this simple plant, the Lord taught Jonah about the way in which God loves all his children. As Jonah is sitting there in the desert, dying of heat, he lets this plant grow and give him shade and shelter. Because he loves Jonah. And he's trying to teach Jonah, I love all of my children. But Jonah's attitude is still horrible. He's still arrogant. He's still self-righteous, so God destroys the plant. And so will be our condition if we keep our arrogance and our self-righteousness. Liking the scriptures unto us. Nineveh had a reputation for being wicked. You can see that in Nahum 3, 1 through 4. There are many wicked cities in our day. Does their wickedness lessen the Lord's feeling for the people of those cities? What is our obligation when we are called to serve in a way that we might consider distasteful? Many callings I've had, not many, some, that I've considered distasteful. Not, not what I would like to have done, but it's what the Lord wanted me to do. It is apparent through the story that Jonah could not stand to see God's love, so often promised to Israel and cherished by her, bestowed on others particular her heathen oppressors. Have you ever known anyone who has tended to resent someone newly baptized or recently activated and the attention and favor they received in the church? Is there not a parallel here? Modern Israel sometimes can be self-righteous and arrogant. The most Latter-day Saints may never be called to do anything as dramatic as calling a whole city to repent or be destroyed, we receive numerous calls on our own from the Lord. Sometimes, like Jonah, we seem to run away or at least to escape our responsibility. Here are some following things to consider. A person who refused to accept a call in primary because she would not be able to attend Relief Society meetings. A young man who turns down a mission call so he can accept a scholarship at a university or because he's a football player and feels that that's more fantastic. A family who does not hold family regular family home evenings. A person who gets behind on his bills and does not pay his tithing. A young woman too shy to accept a call as a young adult Relief Society teacher. We all receive calls and sometimes we try to escape them, but we can repent Accept the call, but can we repent, accept the call, and reap joy in our service? That'll be up to us. This story of Jonah is played out over and over in our lives. And we can either run from the Lord, especially when he calls us to those calls that are just so inconvenient, and I, I just feel so inadequate. Or we can repent, and we can go to Nineveh, and fulfill our call with proper attitudes and drop our arrogance and love all of our neighbors, not just those who are members. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please subscribe to the channel.